Dr. Ron Nash is eminently qualified to address this topic for us. His training is in philosophy and religion. As I told you last night, he is professor of those two disciplines at Western Kentucky State University, is an author of several books dealing with specific aspects of this question, and is very popular as a lecturer uh, dealing with morality of the market and in political applications as well. I became acquainted with Ron this summer at the Foundation for Economic Education when he came to us as, as a guest lecturer uh, at a seminar plan for theologians. He was extremely well received there, and I know he will be here as well, and it's my pleasure to invite him to this podium. Will you welcome Dr. Ronald Nash? I'm going to begin by admitting some things to you that I seldom admit in public. First of all, oh, it makes me tremble. I, I used to live in the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> Not only did I live in the state of Massachusetts, I paid taxes in the state of Massachusetts. I know how the Jews felt when God delivered them from Egypt. When we, when we crossed that Massachusetts state line for the last time, we, we shouted, glory, hallelujah. And then, of course, somebody wants to do for the whole country what he has done for Massachusetts. In fact, a year ago at this time, I actually interviewed for a job in Massachusetts again. I was, I was talked to, uh, people were talking to me about being a vice president at a theological seminary north of Boston, and they offered me twice the salary. And then when I realized I would have to, I would have to pay 400% 400, 400 more for a house and pay the taxes, this 200% this increase in salary would have left me with $10,000 less in real income. So I, I decided to stay in Kentucky. So that's one confession. I've lived in Massachusetts. Second confession. The last time I was on television, oh, I'm embarrassed, I was a guest on the PTL Club. <laughs> now look, when you write books, when you write books, you'll go anywhere and do anything to promote those books, all right? Now because it was the PTL Club, they, they dumped tons of makeup on me. I don't, that must be a policy at the PTL Club. <laughs> they started down here and then they put the makeup up here and then, I don't know, lots of makeup went on up, up here. There was a rumor though when I was at PTL, they said that somebody during that time had removed the makeup from Tammy Faye Baker and they had discovered Jimmy Hoffa under there. Uh, I don't know. In, in, in honor of my brief appearance on the PTL Club, though, we're, we're giving away a premium with my books. Uh, there are three of them back there, Social Justice in the Christian Church and Poverty and Wealth, and then a book called Liberation Theology. Anybody who purchases one of these books before Halloween will get it, no extra charge, an old mascara pencil once used by Tammy Faye Baker. So, um, oh, one final thing. One I am not a card-carrying member of the ACLU. Uh, New England is New England is funny, you know. Uh, the ACLU sued the city of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, several years ago because they put a nativity scene up in front of the city hall, and uh, the local newspaper asked the mayor why the American Civil Liberties Union was suing them for simply putting up a manger scene in front of the city hall, and the mayor of Pawtucket a good Roman Catholic came up with the best answer I could, I've ever heard. He said, I'll tell you why the ACLU does not like nativity scenes. They're jealous. And the reason they're jealous is because in their whole organization, they cannot find three wise men and a virgin. <laughs> nah. that's, that statement actually made it into the Providence, Rhode Island Journal. Well, anyway, I'm here to talk to you today about morality and the market. And I probably have more to, to say than time will permit, so um, I'll just stop about the right time and then we'll see how your, questions, uh, how your questions take us from there. Morality and the market. 
Listen, few people question the economic superiority of capitalism these days. Few people. There are some, but, uh, but many of the critics of capitalism maintain that in spite of its economic superiority, a market system must still be restricted or even abolished because it allegedly fails important moral tests. This kind of moral attack against capitalism appears with increasing frequency in the words of people who pass themselves off as representatives of the Christian church. If some of you parents here today are, should happen to be interested in having your children become Marxists or socialists, one of, the, one of the quickest ways to do that is to send them for their college education to a Christian, to a Christian college these days. I, I, I'm, I'm grieved to say that, but some of you know how true that comment is. Two weeks ago, I spoke at a, uh, at a campus where I had taught 30 years before, Houghton College, a, church, a college connected with the Wesleyan Methodist Church in upstate New York. 30 years ago, Houghton was about as conservative theologically, politically, economically as any college in the country. Today, there are any number of uh, left-wing types who are trying to persuade the sincere Christian students on that campus that if they are going to be faithful to God and if they are going to be faithful to the Bible, they must do everything they can to attack a free market system and do everything they can to institute some kind of collectivist economy, some kind of collectivist society. In fact, as I sat on the platform prior to my own presentation before the whole student body at this college, another Christian professor from another campus got up and actually said this at this campus. He said, do you want to know why there are poor people in America today? It's because they are oppressed and exploited by all the rich people in America today. And that kind of Marxist nonsense is being passed upon Christian college students um, and, and, and is easily confused in their thinking with important Christian tenets. For Christians who think like this, for Christians who, have, who are on the left, and this is true not only of uh, left-wing evangelical Christians uh, who belong to the same branch of Christianity as I do, I'm an evangelical Protestant, but this is true of, of, as well of many Roman Catholics, and of course it's certainly true of many, uh, many in the mainline uh, Protestant denominations. For left-wing Christians like this, capitalism is supposed to be unchristian or anti-Christian because it allegedly gives a predominant place to greed and other unchristian values. For these people, capitalism is alleged to increase poverty and the misery of the poor while at the same time it makes a few people rich at the expense of the many. Socialism, on the other hand, is portrayed as the economic system of people who really care for the less fortunate members of society. You see, if you're really concerned about social justice, if you're really compassionate, you'll turn your back on capitalism, on conservatism, and you'll move quickly to the left. Some writers even go so far as to claim that socialism is an essential part of the Christian gospel. I present a lot of documentation for that claim in this book that's called Poverty and Wealth. Those of you, incidentally, who are familiar with the term liberation theology will recognize how often comments like that appear in the writings of Latin American theologians who call themselves liberation thinkers. Uh, incidentally, if you do not know it, liberation theology has found a home on almost every church-related uh, college campus and seminary campus in this country. It's important, in my judgment, to counter these moral attacks against capitalism. I've done that in some of my writings. Forgive these little commercials. I'll stop making them in a moment. But, for example, in, in Social Justice in the Christian Church, I identify 15 of the major arguments against capitalism. I explain what those arguments are, and I tell Christians how those 15 objections to capitalism can be answered. What I want to do this morning is suggest a strategy to help you counter these moral attacks against capitalism. I can't say everything, so uh, 
uh, perhaps get what you can and outline, and then perhaps you can fill in the gaps through uh, through some of the literature that's at the uh, at the back of the room. I think the first thing that Christians or anyone who is concerned about um, the integrity of economic thinking must do in combating these moral attacks against capitalism is to eliminate a number of important confusions that serve as foundations for this mixed up thinking. So let me identify four or five sources of confusion that seem to infiltrate this confused Christian thinking about capitalism and then in the second half of my remarks I'll go on the offensive and I'll try to give you some positive reasons why I think capitalism is morally superior. Here's the first confusion that we have to deal with. Many times critics of capitalism demonstrate that they have no idea what capitalism is. The capitalism they attack is a caricature. It is a straw man. The stereotype of capitalism that is the target of most such attacks often results from an incorrect association of the word capitalism with existing national economies that should in fact be described not as capitalist but as interventionist. I'm going to have to assume here that you know a little bit about von Mises economics and his distinction between three kinds of economic systems socialism, capitalism, and in the middle this horrible hybrid that is called interventionism or the mixed economy. What these critics do is they look at the economy of the United States, for example, and they say, well, look at all of the problems we have, this vast deficit and uh, all of these other economic problems, and they say, that's what capitalism gives you. Well, the first reply to make is this. No, that's not what capitalism gives you. Those are the problems that result inevitably, as von Mises showed, from interventionism, governmental intervention with the economy. You know what these rascals do next? They blame capitalism for the, for the miseries that are produced by interventionist policies, and then they offer as their solution even more interventionist policies. They can't lose, see? They, they, they cover up entirely the fact that it's interventionism that creates these difficulties, and then they use that as an argument why we need even greater degrees of interventionism. We need to know what capitalism is. I found from my own teaching that one of the best ways to explain the true nature of capitalism to people is to use a distinction that I find in the writings of Walter Williams. Incidentally, I, I get great pleasure when I'm talking to liberals, when I tell them that I derive my economic views from the writings of two black economists who also happen to be two of the leading economists in America today. That always drives them up the wall. And those two black economists, as many of you know, are Walter Williams and Thomas Sowell. I hope you're familiar with their writings. But Walter Williams, who now teaches economics at George Mason University, once made a distinction between <clears throat> the only two ways in which things can be exchanged. He said, if something's to be exchanged, it has to be exchanged in either <clears throat> the first way or the second way. He called them the peaceful means of exchange and the violent means of exchange. Let's take the first one, the peaceful means of exchange. It can be summed up in this phrase, if you do something good for me, then I will do something good for you. When you youngsters go into a McDonald's and you plunk down a buck and a half for a Coke and a quarter pounder or whatever it costs here, what you're really saying is, if you do something good for me, that is give me what I want at the moment, then I'll do something good for you. You want my money more than you want that quarter pounder. I want that quarter pounder more than I want that money. There's a peaceful exchange there. No one is standing in the back of you with a gun forcing you to buy that quarter pounder and that Coke. Now, when capitalism is understood correctly, it epitomizes this peaceful means of exchange. The reason people enter market exchanges is because they believe the exchange is good for them. 
they take advantage of an opportunity to obtain something they want more in exchange for something they value less. Capitalism then should be understood as a voluntary system of relationships that utilizes this peaceful means of exchange. But then Walter Williams goes on and says, but there's another way in which exchange can take place. He calls it the violent means of exchange. Exchange can take place by means of force, violence, coercion. You can sum up the violent means of exchange in this expression. Unless you do something good for me, I will do something bad to you. Unless you do something good for me, I will do something bad to you. Now that, of course, is the way thieves operate. A thief puts a gun in your ribs and says, your money and your life. He could just as easily say, unless you do something good for me, I will do something bad to you. That's also the way tax collectors <laughs> operate. Do you know? If you've been audited lately, I just went through another audit. The IRS auditor didn't say to me, please make a donation. Oh, no. The implication... <laughs> no. No, the implication was, unless you do something good for me, I'm going to do something bad to you. Well, listen, Walter Williams is absolutely correct when he points out that the violent means of exchange is the controlling principle behind socialism. Socialism means more than centralized control of the economic process. Socialism entails the introduction of coercion into economic exchange in order to facilitate the goals of the elite who function as the central planners. Now, one of the great ironies of Christian socialism, which I think is a contradiction in terms, but one of the great ironies of Christian socialism is that its proponents, in effect, demand that the state get out its weapons and force people to fulfill what they think are the demands of Christian love. So I think the first confusion that we have to work on when you're dealing with someone who thinks that Christianity obliges them to move to the left politically and economically is to point out to them that they don't know what they're talking about. They're using words like capitalism and socialism without any clear understanding of what those words should mean. Here's another confusion that I find operating throughout this whole business. There is a clear misunderstanding about the nature of free exchange. Many Marxists, Christian Marxists and Christian socialists, believe that free exchange is what we call a zero-sum game. You kids write that, write that down. I'm going to tell your teacher to test you on that next week. A zero-sum game. Now, what's a zero-sum game? Very easy. A zero-sum game is one where only one participant can win. If one person wins, then the other person must lose. Well, obviously, then, we know a lot of zero-sum games. The Oakland Athletics would tell you today that baseball is a zero-sum game. If the Los Angeles Dodgers win, then the Oakland Athletics lose. Baseball is a zero-sum game. Checkers is a zero-sum game. If A wins, then B must lose. Now, all kinds of Christians think that every time any economic exchange occurs, somebody walks away the winner and the other poor sucker walks away a loser. So that if you walk into a McDonald's and buy a sandwich and a Coke, you've been exploited. Oh, come on, you say, do Christians really think this way? Visit some Christian college campuses. I can name them for you, all right? Yes. I can direct, I, I refer to the books in Poverty and Wealth. I name the books and the authors. Now listen, the error here consists in thinking that market exchanges are zero-sum games. The answer is that market exchanges really illustrate something quite different, a positive-sum game. Write that down, positive-sum game. Now what's that? A positive-sum game is one in which both players can win. Both 
people can walk away from that game or that exchange as winners. Now we must reject the myth that economic exchanges necessarily benefit only one party at the expense of the other. It is this confused thinking that leads to the use of such words as exploitation and depression. In voluntary exchanges, both parties may leave the exchange in better economic shape than would have otherwise been the case. Both parties to a voluntary economic exchange believe that they gain through the trade. And if they didn't perceive the exchange as beneficial, they would not continue to take part in it. Here's the third source of confusion, and there are many that I'm not going to talk about. First source of confusion, they don't know what capitalism is. They don't know what socialism is. The second source of confusion, they think that all economic exchanges are zero-sum games. The third economic confusion, they're all messed up in their thinking about the notion of selfishness. You see, they think that capitalism encourages some sub-Christian traits of character, such as selfishness, for example. Well, listen. It's helpful here to recognize a biblical distinction between selfishness and self-interest. That distinction can be found in the New Testament. When a person is motivated by selfishness, he seeks his own welfare with no regard for the welfare of others. Now, do human beings ever act like that? They do all the time. A lot of people are going to vote on November 8th for purely selfish reasons. But when a person is motivated by self-interest, he can pursue his welfare in ways that do not harm others. In fact, when you act in self-interest as opposed to selfishness, what you do may in fact also result in enormous good to other people. Jesus was once asked, what is the first and great commandment? And Jesus' answer, Matthew 22, went like this. He said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus recognized the legitimacy of self-love. If he didn't, he never would have encouraged us to love our neighbor. As he didn't proceed by saying, stop loving yourself. He said, no, love your neighbor as yourself. I'm just foolish enough to think that in that statement, Jesus was giving implicit approval to self-interest. Listen, there is nothing sinful about caring about what happens to one's family or about oneself. In fact, the New Testament condemns people who lack that kind of concern. 1 Timothy 5.8, read it. Since the kinds of voluntary exchanges that characterize the market are mutually beneficial, that is, in other words, they are a positive sum game, selfishness is not an inherent feature of capitalism at all. People who exchange on the basis of market principles engage in activities that benefit themselves and others as well. The conditions of a free market, in fact, oblige people to find ways of helping themselves at the same time that they help others, whether they do this consciously or not. And so, self-interest can serve as a powerful engine that pulls society along the road to economic progress. Fourth confusion. But you capitalists always base your system on greed. Greed! Capitalism is encouraged, is criticized for encouraging greed. Here's the very simple answer to that. The mechanism of the market does not encourage greed. It neutralizes greed. It neutralizes greed as individuals are forced to find ways of serving the needs of those with whom they wish to exchange. You kids down here, suppose that you've been, you're being observed by the greediest guy in the, in, in, in the country. Let's say he lives in Wichita. Let's say he's the owner of Scrooge Industries. All right? I hope there's no such company in Wichita. And let's say this greedy guy lusts after your money. 
before he goes to bed at night instead of counting sheep he has dreams of your money flowing through his he's he's the greediest guy in the world now that's evil all right that's wrong we ought to feel sorry for that guy but let me tell you if that guy is forced to operate under the conditions of a true market economy his greed can't hurt you his greed can hurt you in a socialist economy because he can get the bureaucrats on his side and they can find ways to steal your money or tax it from you or he can get special favors from Congress. His greed can hurt you in an interventionist economy, but in a market economy, his greed cannot hurt you for this reason. Capitalism says you have rights. Capitalism says you have the right to be protected from acts of force and fraud and theft. All right? That's capitalism. In other words, built into the capitalist ethic are the assumptions that stealing and lying are wrong. Thou shalt not steal is really part of the capitalist ethic. Thou shalt not lie is part of the capitalist ethic. A businessman who misrepresents his product is, is a traitor to a market system. So if this greedy guy is forced to operate within the constraints of a true market system, there's only one way he can get a hold of your money. He must find some good or service, offer that to you, and hope that you will be willing to part with your money in exchange for that good or that service. In other words, what the market does is force that greedy guy to think of you to ask what your desires and your wants and your needs are. That's not the way it operates in socialism. Every person in a market economy, and again, we have to limit, separate this from the distortions of the market economy under which we all live, but every person in a market economy would have to be other-directed. The market is one area of life where concern for the other person is absolutely required. So, the market doesn't pander to greed. The market, rather, is a mechanism that allows natural human desires to be satisfied in a nonviolent way. The fifth and final confusion bef th that we want to eliminate before I go on the offensive, all right? I have to watch my time. A lot of Christians today reject capitalism because their thinking about money has been all messed up by their liberal professors. I was asked several years ago to write a review of a book. The magazine that asked me was Christianity Today that used to be fairly sensible in its economic thinking. This book was called Money and Wealth, authored by a famous German, uh, a European thinker named Jacques Ellul, published in this country by InterVarsity Press. <laughs> Years ago, InterVarsity Press gave us the writings of Francis Schaeffer. Today, InterVarsity Press gives us the writings of Christian Marxists and Christian Socialists. I'm reading this book by Jacques Ellul, and I come across this idea. He says, all money is evil. I got on the phone, and I called the publisher, InterVarsity Press, and I said, now, I've just been reading this book that you published that says, all money is evil, and I have one question. And they said, what's that? I said, are you giving this book away free of charge? <laughs> Meditate on that, all right? Here's a company making money and paying royalties to an author, and the thesis of this book and this author is that money is evil. Now, are these people kidding us or is something else going on here that escapes me. Alul's book contains a number of other claims. Maybe you didn't know this, but read Alul's book. The Bible condemns wealth. Oh, yeah. God hates the rich. Incidentally, if you ever hear somebody telling you that, ask them, ask them to please produce the biblical references, and here's what you'll find. Every biblical reference that these guys cite to prove that God hates the rich is always a verse in which the people being condemned acquired their wealth unjustly, immorally, always. 
They can't find a passage in Scripture in which God condemns the rich uh, who acquired their holdings honestly and morally. Well, Elul says lots of other things. He says Christians sin if they save money for their future. Well, I suppose that would mean then that we could just, you know, give our money away or throw our money away and then hope for the welfare state to take care of us when we retire, which simply means that the state would steal money away from somebody else because of our own, uh, our own folly. Now, if you begin to get the impression that there is a lot of nonsense being circulated in the name of Christianity today, you're absolutely right. But there are hundreds of thousands of Christian young people who are being indoctrinated in this Marxist or at least socialist ideology and their parents have no idea what's going on. Quite often, I'll be at, I'll be at meetings to talk and I'll run into parents and they'll say they're, they're grieving. They, they trusted a school like Wheaton College or some other strong evangelical college to ground their kids in the Christian faith and in the values that they believe in and then four years later their kid comes home and says you know I'm a Marxist well, where did you get this I got this at Wheaton College where do you expect I got it at UCLA well let me go on the offensive not only is the case against the morality of the market incredibly weak there's a powerful case for the moral superiority of capitalism. Let me just quickly sketch some of, the, some of the points that one could make here. Listen, for one thing, the critics of capitalism fail to see how the market process has been a force for improving the lot of the masses. These Christian Marxists talk about exploitation and class warfare, rich against poor. What they fail to recognize is how the market system has improved the lot of the masses. The poor have benefited greatly from market systems. What you find Christian Marxists or Christian leftists talking about often is the distribution of wealth. Often when they talk about the, the redistribution of wealth, they refer to the time when Jesus in the New Testament took five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 people. They say if ever, if ever there was socialism in practice, there it was. Jesus taking the wealth and redistributing it. Here's an answer to that, okay. Listen, before Jesus distributed that wealth, he first did something that socialists don't know how to do. He created that wealth. He created that wealth from five loaves and two fishes. That's what you don't hear from the Christian left. They're so anxious to divide the economic pie up into increasingly smaller pieces, what they don't recognize is the utter importance of creating a bigger, bigger pie. All right? You see, there simply isn't enough wealth to go around. What the poor of any nation need is not continually smaller pieces of a pie that keeps getting smaller. They need a bigger pie. So, don't talk to me about the distribution of wealth until you first explain to me how wealth can be created, how wealth can be produced. But this production of wealth does not happen by accident. It's not like manna from heaven. God can do that. But in order to create wealth, you have to have human action and social cooperation. Proper attention must be given to the forces that underlie the production of wealth. Let me quote from James Gwartney, a fine economist, author of the third best-selling economics text in America, professor of economics at Florida State University, and an outstanding Christian layman. James Gwartney says, goods and services are not like manna from heaven. Individuals must be motivated to produce them to acquire the skills, take the risks, invest in the machines, and supply the human energy and creativity essential for the creation of wealth. Whether we Christians like it or not, Gordney continues, mere mortals are much less willing to make the sacrifices involved in the production process when the fruit of their labors are redistributed to others. Let me, let me hasten along, I'm running out of time. 
in a market system, people are accountable for their economic actions. A market system makes people accountable for their economic activities. Hence, when individuals or businesses act in ways that waste resources, they will be penalized by lower wages or lower profits, or maybe even larger losses. But in an economic system that concentrates decisions in a group of central planners, that's socialism kids, accountability gets lost in the system. Nobody's accountable. This is what's driving Gorbachev crazy. They don't know who to blame in the Soviet Union. They know that everything's going wrong, but where is the accountability? In a market system, the accountability shows up in the profit and loss column. You know what, you know who to blame. In a socialist system, rewards are not related to effort and commercial risk taking, but to party membership, bureaucratic status, political fiat and corruption. And so as a consequence, the legitimate commercial entrepreneurial skill spirit is killed <laughs> under a collectivist economy for perfectly understandable reasons in that kind of system, people devote their resources to hacking their way through a political and bureaucratic jungle. Moreover, capitalism does more than make it possible for people to make money. It provides the basis for a social structure that encourages the development of important personal and social virtues, such as community and cooperation. I spell that out more in more detail in my book, Poverty and Wealth. Another point, private ownership can serve as a stimulus to the, to the development of moral behavior. I suspect that all of you kids have seen the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy. A couple of risque scenes in there, but a lot of laughs in there as well. Eddie Murphy plays a black street hustler who, because of a bet between two wealthy businessmen, is given total ownership of a big bank account and a very expensive house and all of the property in that house. Now, at the beginning of the picture, Eddie Murphy, this black hustler, is going around stealing anything in that house that he can get a hold of. He's putting uh, cigarette uh, ashtrays in one pocket and, and uh, every, remember though, if you saw the movie, he's just filling his pockets because he thinks it's somebody else's property, see? He invites in a bunch of street hustlers and hookers and friends and they start tearing that house apart until one of the wealthy men or the butler says to him, Master, you do realize, don't you, that you own all of this? I own all of this? And out comes the ashtray and everything else. He swipe, he kicks all the bums out of the house and he starts cleaning up. Listen, private ownership plays a role in developing moral character and moral behavior. Listen to Arthur Shenfield from Great Britain. He says, every time we treat property with diligence and care, we learn a lesson in morality. The reason for the moral training of private property is that it induces at least some of its owners to treat it as a trust even if only for their children or children's children. And those who so treat it tend to be best at accumulating it, contrary to popular notions about the conspicuous consumption of the rich. Shenfield goes on, contrast our attitudes to private property with the way we treat public property. Were any of you ever quartermasters in the army? You notice how people handle property that is public property, waste it. Every army quartermaster, every state school administrator, every bureaucratic office controller knows with what carelessness and lack of diligence most of us deal with public property. But private property becomes a trust and changes our attitudes towards it. People do treat their own personal property differently than they treat public property or the property of others. And this can teach important moral lessons. Write this down, kids. Everything has a cost. Isn't that profound? Wouldn't I like the world to think that I thought that up? Everything has a cost. There is no free lunch. Once people realize that few things in life are free, that most things carry a price tag, and that therefore we will, we will have to work for most of the things we want, 
we are in a position to learn a vital truth about life. Capitalism helps teach this truth. But under socialism, it is still true that everything has a cost, but under socialism, everybody is tempted to forget that. Under socialism, everybody acts as though there is no cost or that the cost will be borne by somebody else. This is one of the most corrosive effects of socialism upon the moral character of people. All right, now I've got to draw this to a close. Many religious critics of capitalism focus their attacks on what they take to be its moral shortcomings. In truth, the moral objections to capitalism are a sorry collection of arguments that reflect more than anything else serious confusions about the true nature of a market system. When capitalism is put to the moral test, it more than holds its own against its competition. Listen to Arthur Shenfield again. He says, of all of our economic options, only capitalism operates on the basis of respect for free, independent, responsible persons. Only capitalism. All other systems in varying degrees treat men as less than this. Socialist systems above all treat men as pawns to be moved about by the authorities or as children to be given what the rulers decide is good for them or as serfs or slaves. The rulers begin by boasting about their compassion, which in any case is fraudulent, but after a time they even drop this pretense, which they find unnecessary for the maintenance of power. In all things, they act on the presumption that they know best. Therefore, they and their systems are morally stunted. The alternative to free exchange, what is it? It's coercion and violence. Capitalism is a mechanism that allows natural human desires to be satisfied in a non-violent way. I don't know what you can do to prevent human beings from wanting to be rich. But what capitalism does is channel that desire into peaceful means that benefit many besides those who wish to improve their situation. Shenfield again says, the alternative to serving other men's wants is seizing power over them, as it has always been. Hence, it is not surprising that wherever the enemies of capitalism have prevailed, the result has been not only the debasement of consumption standards for the masses, visit the Soviet Union, but also their reduction to serfdom by the new privileged class of socialist rulers. All right, so what's my conclusion? Capitalism is the most efficient system of economic exchange that any sensible person must admit, but capitalism is also the most moral system of economic exchange. When capitalism, the system of free exchange, is described fairly, there can be no question that it, rather than socialism, comes closer to matching the demands of the biblical ethic. Thank you. I just wrote a book called Choosing a College, a guide for Christian parents and students. It won't be out for a while. But in that book, I wrote this sentence. It is difficult to find one non-trivial statement written by Karl Marx that hasn't been falsified. But Marx, I, I, that may be an overstatement. Marx did talk intelligently about the stupidity <laughs> of the of certain people in the bourgeois class. And what you refer to is, I think, the paramount example of, um, if we may use the word bourgeois, bourgeois stupidity. Some people have done some studies about how the large American foundations, the Rockefeller Foundation and so on, how they use their money. 
and they have reported the shocking fact that the vast majority of these uh, large foundation grants, which of course come into their coffers as a result of market exchanges, go out to support the work of people who are the enemies of the market system. Now, where are the brains of these people? Well, they've turned, the problem is they, these people have turned most of these foundations over to liberals, left-wingers. Um, <coughs> what else can I say but uh, agree with you that this is just a, a mind-boggling situation? Yes? Let me take that first, all right? Would you repeat the question? The question was, how do I understand, how do I explain the verse in which Jesus says it is harder for a rich man to enter through the eye of a needle? I like that. Yes. It is harder for a camel. We'll get it straight yet. Yeah, I've been, I've been watching George Bush so that I... <laughs> I usually get everything all mixed up. Um, it is harder for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. I think, obviously, I believe that's true. Say what? Did I still get it backwards? Uh, see? <laughs> You know the verse. <laughs> you know the verse I'm referring to. All right. <laughs> what does that verse mean? That verse points to a very important truth, and that important truth is that money can uh, a, a, extraordinary amounts of money can often have a negative effect on people's spiritual health. It often does. Not always. There are vast exceptions to that, and I think some of you know some exceptions to that. But don't you also know many wealthy people, especially yuppies in this day and age who have suddenly found themselves to be semi-millionaires through, um, you know, especially through high-tech high and so on. Don't you, don't, can't you see how that money has gone to their heads and has inflated their ego? and made them spiritually proud and brought them to the position where they think that there's no one on earth more important. Well, uh, to whatever extent a person, rich or poor, has that kind of an attitude, he's in trouble when it comes to the kingdom of God, my friends. The entrance to the kingdom of God has as, as one of its prerequisites spiritual humility. The recognition that I am not God I am a sinner before God, and I had better start dealing with that. So there's an important spiritual truth there. The problem comes when people want to take that important truth and say, of course, that there's something wrong uh, with all wealth. And I can give you a dozen other verses to show you that that extended interpretation of that would be a mistake. Are you satisfied with my handling of that? Well, uh, almost. Uh, <laughs> I guess what was still not clear in my own mind, how do you object, uh, can overcome the objection that, that that verse would encourage the possibility of the word of God? Well, Jesus used hyperbole. He used figures of speech. He did it all the time. He talked about faith as the size of a grain of mustard seed. And you could say to this mountain, move, you know, move and so on. That's hyperbole. Now, People who are good at this sort of thing use hyperbole in order to get people's attention. And when you exaggerate, when you overstate, because sometimes you have to say things in a way that will get people's attention, right? When you exaggerate, when you use hyperbole, people will listen to what you say. But wise people will always look at that hyperbole and say, okay, now, what is the... What is the bottom line to that? Jesus is not saying that the rich cannot get into the kingdom of heaven because, and again, I, I give these passages in, in my book, Poverty and Wealth, he was the friend of many wealthy people. 
Wealthy people invited him to their home. He sat down and had dinner with them. And in all of those encounters, never once uh, challenged their wealth or criticized them for their wealth. What he did make clear was that their wealth was held in trust from God and they had a, they had a stewardship responsibility to God to use that for, uh, for uh, spiritual purposes. Now you had another verse. Uh, uh, the, other, the other one that I wanted to ask was, uh, I think the same question this lady brought up. Uh, uh, could you maybe, I'm going to challenge that a little bit because uh, I think there is a real big problem with our industry, just like it is individuals. We have, uh, I think we have a problem ourselves. Almost every avenue of our lives where, 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 where we really believe government should intervene. But it seems like corporations uh, actively pursue this because it's in their interest to do so. Uh, some of, some of the they pursue what? I'm, I'm lost. Well, there's no uh, better market uh, a lot of companies perceive than to have a captive market, uh, to have get an exclusive franchise. Uh, you know, Coca-Cola gets uh, a Red China and Pepsi, Co uh, Pepsi, uh, Pepsi gets Russia. My own industry, uh, Hayek said, uh, private money has often been preferred to private money, but government has often been preferred. Well, interestingly, i found that the bureaucrats are incompetent to trust private money, but who's not incompetent, are the people in my industry who will lobby and abuse the bureaucracy of the government to try and suppress uh, things or to suppress the competition? And that, that, you know, it seems like there's a yeah. it's a moral thing with with it's a moral thing rather than an economic. Thing. Now I hate I hate to keep referring to this, but I really. All of the things that I couldn't say here, all of these words of wisdom that I had to, I, I do discuss almost all of these issues in this thing, in this book called Poverty and Wealth. Here's what I say. Obviously, a market system is superior morally and uh, economically to a, to a collectivist system. But why, why do so many businessmen resist any further move to a market system, you know? And the answer is obvious. It's right there in the Bible. It's a three-letter word called sin. You see, in a market, there's, there's, there's one characteristic of a market system, and that is there's no security in a market system. Any day a businessman or businesswoman opens her door, she'll ne she never knows in advance what the market might do to her that day. She can only wait and see. And so because a lot of people want that kind of security, guaranteed security that isn't available in a genuine market system, they hedge their bets. And they hedge their bets through illegal activities, immoral activities, seeking special favors from government, all of these being manifestations of, of human sin. So we need to recognize, when, when I defend capitalism, I am not defending the practices of even the majority of businessmen in the United States or businesswomen in the United States. I, do you not know that some of the greatest enemies of the capitalist system in the West are business people, right? They, are, and they may talk a good game, but through their practices, immoral, corrupt, seeking favors from government, they in effect are pounding nails into the, into the capitalist coffin. So don't take anything that I've said as a blanket word of approval about anybody who happens to be in business, okay? Well, what about you kids? May I call you kids? <laughs> what about you young men and women? Any of you have any questions? Here's a senior citizen here, yes. <laughs> uh, some of the people I talk with don't so much address the issue that capitalism is the cause of immorality or it's an immoral system. But they're the kind of people who say, <coughs> Well, we know socialism doesn't work, but capitalism can't work either because you need moral people in order for the system to stay afloat. 
they're not saying that capitalism is immoral, they're just saying we need moral people. <coughs> because the Bible tells us that we don't have moral people, we've got people with sin natures, therefore capitalism really can't work either. So therefore we've got to go to what Juan Mises says is this middle ground, is that interventionist state. Can you comment on that? Well, me? yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, let me say that capitalism does not need moral people to work. As I told you, when, when, when a capitalist system is set up properly, it neutralizes things like greed, all right? It takes greed and channels it into other directions. But um, those of my friends on the left who say, well, we want to avoid socialism, we want to avoid collectivism, therefore let's all become interventionists, which of course is exactly the system that produced the Great Depression of 1929. Read Dr. Senholz's book, all right? That was inter if you want a depression, just, just line up with interventionism. Of course, what these people fail to recognize is that, uh, yes, businessmen are sinners. Yes, consumers are sinners. But unfortunately, so too are politicians. And so too are those rascals who will be making the economic decisions that will manipulate and tinker with the economy. If you can't get... I sometimes... I sometimes describe capitalism as democracy in economics. Just as the American, see the American founding fathers recognized the fact of human sin. That's why they gave us the political system that they did. They said let's disperse power as widely as we can uh, 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 about the political spectrum. Let's not have a king Let's make sure that we have a Congress and an executive branch and a judicial branch and then we have the states and we elect senators and representatives on, on, on a sporadic basis. They wanted power diffused because they knew that men are not angels, men are sinners. So let's not allow too much power to get localized in one place. That's what capitalism does. It spreads economic power out. Ah, but my socialist friends say, yeah, but capitalism always results in monopolies. Oh, no, my friends. No, 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 no. Again, you know. Another commercial. Another commercial. Read this. Dr. Senholz has no doubt talked about this. You know what causes monopolies? It's governmental intervention that grants special privileges to special businesses, thereby excluding other businesses from any free access to the market. In almost every case where a long-term monopoly comes into existence, it comes into existence with the help, the support of government, the state. Well, again, lots of stuff going on here. One more question, maybe. Yes? You use the term uh, evangelical churches, and I, I'd uh, recommend some elaboration or definition on this. We have in Wichita a new organization of an alliance of ministers who I believe identify themselves as evangelical. Uh, they are functioning and, and have uh, objectives of serving as a balance against uh, what a lot of us think are the liberal trend in them in the churches. Would you uh, give some definitions? All right, I'll try. May I preface that with another commercial? I've also done a book called Evangelicals in America that um, is Vanna White's favorite book, incidentally. I don't, I don't. There, are 50, there, are 50 million, there are 50 million evangelicals in America, we're told. They represent an enormously wide variety of beliefs and practices. They include the Pentecostals, like Pat Robertson, or some other Pentecostals whom I will not mention, but whose names have been on television recently. They include fundamentalists, like Jerry Falwell. And the evangelical movement also includes mainstream evangelicals, like Billy Graham and Chuck Colson, and that's where I am myself. I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm not a Pentecostal. I think I'm, I'm in what I call the center of the evangelical movement, where people like Billy Graham and Chuck Colson are. Now here's, I think you could say uh, an evangelical is characterized by these three or four beliefs, all right? First of all, an evangelical, if he really is an evangelical, is someone who has had a religious conversion. 
We sometimes call that being born again. He has had, he has, he has had an experience in which he has placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ as his only hope for heaven. If you think you're an evangelical and you haven't had that kind of an experience, you need to talk to somebody after the meeting today. Secondly, an evangelical takes a very high view of the Bible. He regards the Bible as the inspired, authoritative Word of God. It is our ultimate rule of faith and practice. None of this humanistic approach to the Bible, it's the Word of God, and we'd better square our faith and practice with it. Thirdly, an evangelical is somebody who takes seriously the historic creeds of the Christian church. On that count, evangelicals and Catholics agree. They agree uh, in, the, in their belief in the Trinity. They believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. They believe that Jesus' death was an atonement for human sin. They believe that he was born through the Virgin Mary. They believe that he rose bodily from the dead. So evangelicals are orthodox, traditional, conservative in their theology. And the fourth characteristic, and here some depart a little bit, but uh, an evangelical will, is often a person who believes that he must share this faith with other people. The practice of evangelism, witnessing. I just witnessed to my faith, all right? So those are four basic ingredients of an evangelical faith, but within that basic agreement, you find enormous diversity. Some Pentecostals think you have to speak in tongues. Some fundamentalists think that you have to <laughs> punch out people like Billy Graham. You know, there's a lot wide diversity there, but there are 50 million people like that, we're told, in America. Does that help? Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't tie them in as a balance against uh, what many of us think is a liberal trend in the church worldwide, the world Catholic well, churches. I talked about the religious beliefs of the evangelicals to the extent that there are liberal denominations in America today. An evangelical is going to disagree against a church that says maybe Jesus was just a good man. These are the people who think the last temptation of Christ ought to get an Academy Award, all right? Um, uh, an evangelical will disagree with a liberal Protestant who says, I don't think the Bible's the Word of God. But what you need to recognize is that the waters, the evangelical waters have gotten very muddy in the last 20 years. And henceforth, there are many people who are theologically evangelical, but who are politically to the left of Michael Dukakis. <laughs> they are. And these are the people who are pulling the strings in many of these evangelical Christian colleges. So, you. It, it's a very complicated situation, and before we turn this into a religious revival with an altar call, maybe we had better... One more question. All right. All right. Let, me, let me, uh, pursue this one, one more, that there, there are influences like the church getting into political issues like disinvestment, like, uh, sanctions against, uh, against, uh, fruit of the loom and, uh, against Nestle and some of those now you take play those beside each other. Well, you find if somebody is liberal politically, whether he's an evangelical or not an evangelical, you may very well find him lining up with those liberal social causes. You you may find evangelicals picketing outside of Nestle headquarters saying, you know, their their practices are immoral. Uh, that simply is part of this whole confused picture. And I guess all I could say is that if you ever come across a copy of that book called Evangelicals in America, that could answer things that we really don't have time to pursue here any further. And then you could get back to me and write me a letter and I'll explain whatever else. Bruce? Okay.